We're talking about nursing care after total joint replacement. It's on page 954 in your book at the bottom of the page. And if you'll flip over to the next on page 956, um, there's a picture of a man. He looks pretty happy. And he has had a TKA, total knee arthroplasty. Knee replacement all means the same thing. Usually in the charts, you're going to see this TKA, and that's what that means is total knee arthroplasty. What we have here in this picture is what's called a CPM machine, continuous passive motion. And we will be putting these on and off of people quite a bit. And the first time you do it, make sure you have either me or one of the staff at the place that you're working with you. And have I put these on people by myself before? Yes, I have. But this thing is pretty heavy especially the base part. I bet the whole thing together weighs maybe 35, 40 pounds. And not only is it heavy, it's quite bulky. As you can see, it takes up most of the bed. It just works better to use two people. And yes, you'll see nurses, like I said, I've done it myself. I've put a patient on this before, but it's risky to the staff trying to lift and maneuver this. It's risky to the patient. I have, um, even hurt a patient before, not seriously, but, you know, bumping into him here, which could have been avoided if I'd had someone helping me. But really, these work best if you have one person holding the person's leg up, the other person putting it on. It takes a little extra time, but it's so much better for everyone involved to make this a, a two-person thing. So this is a what a CPM looks like. The physical therapist will write an order for how long they have to use it. Um, usually it'll say something like um, two hours, three times a day. But really, we're, we're to encourage the client to use the, C, the CPM as much as tolerated post-op. And this was a question in the um, NCLEX review. How often should someone use it? Really as often as they can. So the physical therapist's orders for two hours a day or two hours at a time times three, that's like a minimum. So unless they're just really, really gung-ho, this is something that we want them to use as much as they can. And so it's passive because the person isn't bending their leg. The machine does the work. So this little part right here, it slides up and down, up and down. And in the process, it's going to straighten the leg, bend the leg, straighten the leg, bend the leg over and over again. And then you can dial in how to what degree it bends the knee. The physical therapist usually does that. Nursing, in general, unless we're told differently, we're not supposed to change these controls at all. That's a, the physical therapist's job. Our job is to put the patient in it and, and time them and have them do it. The patient holds this little remote control, and this is basically just a start and stop is all this is. And so we get their leg cushioned in here, and then the patient does the start and stop as they want. And let's see, so that's the main post-op thing that you may not know about that you'll see with a total knee. Total hip. I put these gross pictures on here because this is what you'll see. When you look at your patient that's had a total hip replacement, the incision will be something like this up here. This little hole right here is where they have a drain and you can see it here and a lot of times after hip replacement they will have a drain because there's a lot of um, blood and just um, really just water leaking from the tissue and it'll cause this to swell so a lot of times they'll put a drain in to drain that extra fluid but this is the main part I wanted to see you to see see all this bruising that's very typical that does not mean that somebody did something wrong that this patient was dropped or whatever it's just very common to see the bruising and we don't want to mistake this one because this incision looks great. If I were documenting this incision, I, I would call it pristine. You don't want to say redness at the incision even though this is redness in the surrounding area because this is a bruise. When you look right here at the incision, it's neatly approximated, looks great. This is just a bruising and if you look up at this picture, even though it's gross, it shows why. Um, this is what's going on during the surgery. So see these metal clamps? This person's going to have a bruise right where that clamp is pressing against their leg, right? 
and they're probably going to have a bruise right here where sh that clamp is pressing against the leg. So when someone has a surgery like this, it's pretty traumatic, and so that's why we see a lot of this bruising going on. And on the next page, yeah, types of drains. So it's very common, again, to have um, drains that we have to take, and nursing's job is to take care of these drains and until the um, surgeon comes back and takes them out. So there's three main types that we'll see. A Penrose drain, um, it doesn't necessarily have a safety pin, but um, I'll explain what it is, is. This is just a really flexible tube, slightly larger than a drinking straw. But instead of, you know, how a drinking straw is kind of firm, this is real floppy. And that's all it is, is just basically a floppy straw that goes into the wound and it allows the um, fluid that's deep within the wound to drain out. We put um, a bunch of 4x4 four four gauze underneath it to absorb it, and that's all we do, and we change the gauze when it gets saturated with blood. The reason that this one shows having this little safety pin on it is sometimes um, we'll put something like that to keep it from getting sucked back into the wound where we can't reach it, but you may not see that on there. Then we have a JP drain. It stands for Jackson Pratt, but we usually call it a JP. And it looks like a little hand grenade here. And it is about the size to fit in the palm of your hand. And this one adds a little bit of extra suction to it. So it's hard to see, but this is where you can pop the top. So if, say, if you wanted to empty it, it's full of blood and you want to empty it, you pop this top, flip it over, and you just squeeze the blood out and measure it. But then, while you have it squeezed, so this is this is real squishy, and while it's completely collapsed, then you put the lid back on it, and it'll stay squished, and it creates a vacuum, and it will draw that fluid out. And so, when you see these, they're always squished or collapsed in on themselves, and that's the way they're supposed to be because that's what creates the vacuum or the suction. And so it's suction without necessarily having to hook it up to a big old wall suctioning unit. It just uses a really low-tech low, low tech type of suction just creating a vacuum with the air. And we empty them and then just com compress them again. Sometimes they'll have more than one and then we label them one and two and that shows us on their um, paperwork where we document like this one looks like it has a lot more drainage than this one. So we'd say um, JP drain number one has 30 milliliters of drainage, whereas JP drain number two only has 10 milliliters of drainage. And then the last one is called a hemovac. This is for if you have more drainage usually. And this one basically has the same principle as these, except for it looks more like an accordion. And as it fills up, this accordion is go is going to open up and store more, and again, it's it's collapsed and it's drawing the the difference is we don't have to collapse these every time we drain them; they just stay this way. Now we'll talk about a total hip. Um, we're going to see tons of these in our clinical, and there are lots and lots of rules. And a lot of times, what the surgeon will write is total hip precautions and that'll be his doctor's orders or her doctor's orders and so each facility has somewhere an interpretation of what total hip precautions means but in general you you kind of need to memorize that and so I'm going to go over what most facilities consider to be total hip precautions and things that we have to do when someone has this hip replacement surgery very very important avoid flexion greater than 90 degrees so as you're sitting in your chair, if it's a flat chair, guess what? You're at 90 degrees. So can't do that. Have to um, be somewhat reclined. And this can go on for about six weeks. So we don't want the hip to ever flex more than 90 degrees. So that means you can't put on your own socks and shoes unless you have a, a device. So someone might have to help you do that. It also means that we might have to get a raised toilet seat. If the toilet is low enough that your knees go up above your hips, then that's greater than 90 degrees. So never can someone sit and their knees are higher 
than what their hips are, at least for six weeks after a total hip. Avoid addu adduction and internal rotation. When you think adduction, think of adding your leg closer to your body. So crossing the legs is a major no-no. We don't want the legs to cross, and that's why we'll see those um, foam wedges or pillows between the legs to prevent them from crossing, like when we turn somebody onto their side to maybe change a wet sheet or something. We don't ever want those legs to cross over each other. Generally, you're going to avoid turning to the operative side. So if they had a left hip replacement, we're not going to put them on that left hip. And then I have unless dot, dot, dot. Uh, I worked on the ortho unit at Deaconess, and we had one or two surgeons that actually liked for us to put the patient onto their operative side. And the patient sometimes said it felt pretty good because it's kind of swollen and, and full of fluid and you put them on there and it puts a little bit of pressure and it's kind of like it acts like how a baby likes a teething ring when it has a tooth coming in it kind of but just a little bit of pressure to ease that swelling and pain and so sometimes you might have a, a physician that wants you to turn the patient to their operative side but in general unless you have that order you're going to avoid turning them to the operative side we want to use chairs with arms so that they can use their arms to help them get up and not put so much pressure on there I already talked about raised toilet seat then lovely acronyms we're going to encounter a lot of acronyms in nursing and unfortunately a lot of times they're not defined for you when you see these on the chart so you're just going to see a, a physician order that says WBAT PWB TDWB and you just have to know them because there's not anything that's going to look them up although sometimes your phone will tell you so here's a real brief um, explanation weight bearing as tolerated that means the patient doesn't have any restrictions other than what they say hey that hurts so we can get them up they can walk um, it's just allowing them to do whatever they can do without it hurting partial weight bearing um, partial weight bearing and touchdown weight bearing kind of mean approximately the same thing they can put so if they had a left hip done they can put just a little bit of weight on that left foot and kind of limp along but they should be using something like a walker so that they're not putting full weight on that operative leg non weight bearing that means they can't bear any weight and it will say non weight bearing to left leg or right leg or whatever that means they're not to even put it down on the floor at all so you have to know what those mean watch for breakdown on the good heel why would we watch for breakdown on the good heel when so if they had a left hip surgery well because of this non-weight bearing sometimes or because it's tender so when they're pulling them or pushing themselves up in bed because patients are always slipping down in the bed they're going to be digging that good heel into the bed to push themselves up and so that's a, a good way to get a breakdown on that good we're also going to carefully monitor circulation and sensation in the affected extremity distal to the surgery. So we're going to feel the toes, for instance, and we need to compare extremities because they had left hip surgery and we feel, and oh my goodness, the left toes are ice cold. Um, something's terribly wrong, but if we feel the right toes and they're cold too, then we know, oh, this patient is just cold all around. But if there's a difference, whereas the left is cold and the right's warm, then we know that there's some type of circulation um, difficulty going on. Monitor for infection. That would be um, purulent or um, color discharge from the wounds, either like snotty looking or white discharge. Also, infection would be warmth, so um, excessive warmth at the incision site. We're going to determine the need for ADL or activity of daily living assistance and help where we're needed, but also encourage the patient to be as independent as possible. No uncontrolled pain. We're also going to anticipate the pain. Premedicate 30 minutes to one hour prior to their PT or OT. And so, yes, pain is what the patient says it is. But sometimes if they say, I'm really not having much pain, but we know they're getting ready to have pain because they're going to be doing a lot of PT, then we go ahead and medicate them for that so that they will do their PT because that's so important to um, their healing process and prevention of DVTs.